This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Tisha Manteep with the Neurology Podcast. I just finished reading this awesome article called Circadian Features of Cluster Headache and Migraine, a Systematic Review, Meta-Analysis, and Genetic Analysis. This to me was a phenomenal and really elegant paper. With me to discuss is Mark Baruch, an Assistant Professor and Director of the Will Earn Headache Research Center at the University of Texas Health Houston McGovern Medical School. Hi, Mark. Hi, thanks. That's a mouthful, but thank you, Tasha, for for having me on. Well, uh, your paper is quite the read. Thank you for that. So uh, let's start with why did you set out to study the circadian system in migraine and cluster headache? Obviously, it's an important phenomenon, but why did you feel it was important? I think for cluster headache, it was a fairly obvious thing. We knew that cluster headache, just from patients in my clinic and and from doing research, that it had some circadian features. And we just wanted to know how deep does that go. So that's what we were interested in for cluster. For migraine, I was looking into the circadian features of things. and, And it seems like things that reset your internal circadian clock are things like bright lights, skipping meals, changing your sleep cycle. And those are things that patients tell me all the time are triggers for their migraines. So we also said, well, while we're looking at cluster headache, we should also look into migraine and see how deep it goes on that side too. Yeah. And as we know, they're cousins. So I think appropriate to combine them. What about the neuropeptide? I know there's some relationship between calcitonin gene-related peptide and the circadian rhythms, especially hypothalamus. Did you find any genetic connections there? In our study, it did not come up as much, although there's some data that CGRP is expressed in the hypothalamus, including the SCN. I think that one of the other interesting ones is one that is co-localized with CGRP, PACAP38, which is a new trending molecule. That one is um, widely used by the circadian system, co-expressed with CGRP, so there's some kind of connection there. But it'd be interesting to think of where does CGRP work, where does PACAP work in the system. Another interesting reason that we got into the study was this timing of headaches, especially for cluster headaches. I think a lot of us as clinicians that see cluster headache patients have noticed that we don't hear from them all year. And then all of a sudden when their episodic cluster headache cycle starts, they all seem to kind of come in around the same time, you know, maybe March or April or somewhere around the time zone changes. And I call these my submarine patients because you hear nothing from them for a long, long time. And then they pop up and you got to do everything quickly and get everything right away. And then they kind of disappear again for a long time. Can you let me know what the objective of your study was? Our objective was to try to catalog and build a foundation for circadian research in this field. So the idea was that both cluster and migraine have some circadian properties, but what is the full scope of that? Is it at the genetic level? Is it at melatonin and kind of a hormonal or molecular kind of system level there? Or is it just the behavioral level? And so we kind of just wanted to characterize the entire scope of this so that then people could do future research in this area. So I guess maybe we should step back a little bit. Can you describe what we know, or at least the current knowledge of the behavioral aspects of circadian features in migraine and cluster headache, generally speaking? With cluster headache, behaviorally, we've noticed that a lot of patients say that the headaches start at the same time every day. So it may be different for different patients, but patient number one says, I get headaches every day at two in the morning. And patient number two says, I get headaches every day at three in the afternoon. I had one patient that I was asking all the questions, a standard question. I think he's getting a little tired of all my questions. He said, you know, if you just wait for 15 minutes, that's when I get my headaches. You know, that's how confident he was of when the timing of its headaches were. So we've seen that for cluster headache. For migraine, it's a little less precise, but patients generally say, you know, I I don't have headaches at three in the morning. I, I tend to have them when I get up or I tend to have them in the afternoon, or in the early afternoon, but there is a, a time where I don't get them kind of in the middle of the night or the late evening. So those are the behavioral things that I, I think we knew about. And then we're kind of trying to decide how, you know, see how deep that goes. And from what I understand with your study, you catalog the circadian features at the behavioral systems and cellular levels with this meta-analysis as well as genetic analysis of control genes. 
Can you describe what that process was like? We looked at two things at the behavioral level, two things at the systems level, and two things at the molecular level. On the behavioral level, what time of day and what time of year do you have headaches? So the day of time, we've already talked about the annual cycle for cluster headache specifically, um, time of year, patients will get a whole bunch of cycles, a whole bunch of headaches, and then they go away, and then they may come back later in the year. For migraine, there does seem to be a little bit of a pattern to it. So we looked into the annual and, and daily cycle. We also looked into chronotype, are you a morning lark or a, a night owl or something like that. On the systems level, it was hormones, melatonin and steroids, and then genes active in certain brain areas that we could kind of put together through a baboon study. And then the last part on the molecular level, there are about 14 genes that are involved in your core circadian cycle, things that turn your clock on at certain times, off at certain times. And so we looked at those 14 genes for cholesterol and migraine. And then we also looked at what those genes target. So they can turn on other genes and turn off other genes. Um, so altogether, a couple of different systems, a couple of different behavior, a couple of different molecular things. So tell us about your results and what does your investigation indicate about the circadian features of cluster headache? Starting with cluster headache, we found that about 70% of patients who have cluster headache have a daily rhythm to their headaches. And for most people, if you would put all the studies together, it's in the very early morning, somewhere between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. That's the time where most people get their headaches. And so that's not surprising, I think, to people in neurology or in the headache community. That's when most people say they get their headaches. We also found that there are some core circadian genes. So some of these genes that turn each other on and off that control your cycle have expected names like clock. Um, and so clock was one of the genes that it seems to be implicated in cluster headache. Uh, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get cluster headaches, but it, it has some association with it. And then finally, uh, we found that there are lower melatonin levels. So if you look at the behavioral level, there's something. If you look at the systems level, melatonin, there's something. If you look at the genetic level, there's something there too. So the implications for cluster headache, in part, it confirms what we already knew about cluster headache as far as when the headaches happen. It also suggests that this is goes all the way to the molecular and genetic level, that there are changes in the core circadian cycle that are implicated in this disorder. So this is a circadian disorder at its most fundamental level. And what about for migraine? For me, migraine is almost the more interesting part of this than cluster headache. We kind of knew we were going to find something with cluster headache. We didn't know for migraine, but migraines tend to happen during the day. They don't really happen between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. And lower melatonin levels are seen for that. Interestingly, when you're having a migraine, the melatonin levels drop even lower. Uh, why that is, is is unclear, but it was really interesting. And then kind of at a, a cellular level, there's actually a gene that causes both migraine and a circadian rhythm disorder where you basically shifting you so much that you are, I think it was an extreme morning lark. So you, these patients have an extreme sleep schedule and get migraines, and that is a core circadian gene. So if you change core genes in the circadian cycle, it can give you migraines. So again, just like cluster headache, migraine seems to be at a at, at kind of a basic level, a circadian disease in some ways, and not exactly the same as cluster headache, but still it's there. I think that's really interesting because we know there's a seasonal variation of migraine and some people attribute that to changes in weather. It's interesting for migraine, there's this pattern that headaches happen more often between April and October. April is spring, obviously, and October is fall. So that's when a lot of the weather changes are happening. And whether that, if that's due to the weather or really just due to the amount of sunlight or whatever is the yearly cycle is kind of interesting. And so your findings reinforce the role of the hypothalamus for both disorders. Can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on that and any treatment implications? The hypothalamus is a really interesting structure for headaches. If you put people in a, an MRI scanner and look which parts of the brain light up, Usually the hypothalamus, both for migraine and cholesterol, is one of the first areas to light up. It has a lot of connections to other brain areas that we think are important for headaches. So we think it's an important structure. It also happens to have the your central clock, the, the primary circadian clock, the thing that kind of coordinates all the other clocks in your body, which is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's in the anterior part of the hypothalamus. So when we think the circadian part is 
the circadian rhythms are important, usually that means that there's some control function going on in the anterior hypothalamus that might be modulating things. And so it kind of reinforces the fact that the hypothalamus is involved in these headaches. Other parts of the hypothalamus that may be interesting, we found for cluster headache that the paraventricular nucleus seems to have some of the circadian genes active in it, or some of the cycling genes, things controlled by the circadian, core circadian genes. Uh, The paraventricular nucleus is a kind of central control area for autonomic features, things that in cluster would make your eye turn red or water or your nose run. So we think that the hypothalamus is, we always thought it was important, but this kind of reinforces that maybe the circadian part is involved as well. And what are the treatment implications? There are a couple of treatment implications. The first is some of the medications we're using right now, like steroids and melatonin that are treatments for both cluster headache and migraine, may in part be working on the circadian rhythms for these headaches. If these headaches happen at certain times of day and we're giving medications that alter your circadian rhythms, maybe they're actually functioning on that system as opposed to, you know, for example, in steroids, maybe it's not an anti-inflammatory effect or maybe it's both. So that's one part of it. The other is, could this help guide future treatment? For the last few years, we've obviously had lots of different medications come out that target the trigeminal system. CGRP blockers, so calcitonin gene-related peptide blockers, that is a peptide used in the trigeminal system. We don't have a lot of drugs that alter the circadian cycle. Steroids and melatonin are two. Lithium for cluster headache is another one that's a strong modulator of the circadian system but there are not a lot of other strong modulators. And so maybe that's a new avenue for treatments in the future. And how do your findings change clinical practice for patients with migraine and cluster headache? The immediate effects of this are to help explain why these symptoms happen. So if a patient comes in and says, doc, I get headaches every day at 2 a.m., that should put flags up to say, well, maybe this is cluster headache, or you know, maybe it is something tied to a headache disorder. Even though it's not in the official definition of cluster headache, it is something that we see in those patients. And for migraine, because they can start around 7, 8 a.m., you know, if they happen regularly at 7 8 or 8 a.m., patients may go crazy trying to figure out, you know, is, it, is, my, is my bed too hard, or how much coffee am I drinking, or what am I eating for breakfast? And maybe it has nothing to do with any of those things. Maybe that's just the time that you get headaches. So it helps explain some things to patients. It helps put flags up for doctors to recognize that these are things that happen with patients and hopefully helps kind of reassure people of what's going on. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We do have some patients in clinic that present with unilateral headache and cranial autonomic symptoms, and you're not sure quite if it fits the criteria for a cluster versus migraine. There's sometimes some of this overlap. And I think the very strong circadian features of cluster headache can be useful in swaying the diagnosis. Yeah. And Tesha, I don't know about you. When a patient with migraine comes and sees me and starts describing their aura, you know, I see this crescent-shaped zigzag thing. I will actually Google fortification spectra, pull it up and show me, you know, any of these look like what you have. And it helps reassure them that as a doctor, I know what's going on with you. I think I have an idea what you're going through is not odd. Even though you have a, a visual hallucination, this is not a psychosis. You know, and, and same idea with circadian things. If you start showing them data, you know, these do happen at 2 a.m. This is not something odd that you feel weird about telling me. Great point and great research. And hopefully this dissemination of this research will help reduce that diagnostic delay of cluster headache and migraine as well, which is so common. Yeah. Well, thank you guys very much for your interest and, and thanks for reading it. And thank you for listening to the Neurology Podcast. Please do check out the article in May's Neurology. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.